Hello, everybody. Um, it is wonderful to see so many of you here uh, in, uh, in Matrix. And I know that we have also a very big online audience. My name is Marion Fourcade. I am a professor of sociology and the director of social science Matrix here at Berkeley. We organize a lot of events at, at Matrix, but some are very special to us. The Matrix Distinguished Lectures are in this category. They have been with us since the beginning of Matrix. We organize them only once or twice a year for very special people. And the Mat Matrix lecture usually stays in Berkeley for a few days. Today's event, however, is extra special um, because it came together as a joint effort with our partner institution in the humanities. So before we start, I want to express my gratitude to Professor Stephen Best and the Townsend Center for helping us bring today's esteemed guest to Berkeley. Now it is with unmitigated pleasure that I welcome Professor Orlando Patterson to Berkeley and introduce his matrix lecture and the series of event, events that is to follow. Now I must say it is very intimidating to introduce Professor Patterson and not only because he was the chair of my dissertation committee. <laughs> no, the real reason is that his accomplishments in every domain of public and intellectual life are truly, truly remarkable. Orlando Patterson is a John Coles Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. He previously held faculty appointments at the University of the West Indies, his alma mater, and at the London School of Economics, where he also received his PhD. But maybe you do not know that he started out as a novelist and a quite extraordinary one at that. In fact, a critic dubbed him the Caribbean Zola, after the publication of his first novel of three children of Sisyphus. In academia, he is of course, a scholarly giant who has written on the culture and practices of freedom, the comparative study of slavery and ethno-racial relations, the cultural sociology of poverty and underdevelopment with special reference to the Caribbean and African-American youth and the sociology of sports, especially the game of cricket. At Harvard, he is a beloved um, teacher and charismatic teacher who just finished lecture this past week to 450 undergraduates about the sociology of human trafficking. Let's ponder that. He's a public intellectual who publishes widely in journals of opinion and the national press, too many to count. And last but not least, he has played a major role as a policy figure in Jamaica for eight years. He was special advisor for social policy and development to Prime Minister Michael Manley. And then in 2021, he completed a major report on the future of public education in Jamaica. Professor Patterson is the author of countless academic papers and six major academic books, including his classic Slavery and Social Death, uh, published in 1982, which won the Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship Award of the American Sociological Association. Freedom in the Making of Western Culture, published in 1991, and that one won the National Book Award for Nonfiction. The Ordeal of Integration, published in 1997, and The Cultural Matrix, and Outstanding Black Youth, published in 2015, and that's among others. The Sociology of Slavery, his dissertation and first academic book in 1967 on Black slave society in Jamaica, is now being republished with a new preface. And then there's another forthcoming book, which is a long and expanded interview with David Scott, which is coming out as the paradox of freedom in a few weeks. And, will be, and that will be the subject of tomorrow's lunchtime conversation. And I hear that there are two more volumes of essays that are forthcoming from Polite Press, uh, uh, one on enslavement and one on culture. Culture and, and ethnicity. Culture and ethnicity and race. And then finally, on Wednesday, Professor Patterson will talk about the confounding island, his 2019 monograph on the post-colonial dilemma in Jamaica. And that talk will be in the geography department colloquium. We could not have a better respondent to Professor Patterson lecture than Stephen Best. Professor Best is the director of the Townsend Center for the Humanities and a professor of English and Film and Media Studies here at Berkeley. He's a scholar of American and African-American literature and culture, cinema and technology, rhetoric and the law and critical theory. He studies the critical nexus between slavery and historiography, 
as well as the varying scholarly and political preoccupations with establishing the authority of the slave past in black life. He is the author of two books, The Fugitive's Property, Law and the Politics of Possession, published in 20, uh, 200, 2004, um, which is a study of property poetics and legal amenities in 19th century American literary and legal culture. And most recently, he published None Like Us, Blackness, Belonging, Aesthetic Life in 2019. He has also co-edited three special issues of the journal representations titled respectively Redress, The Way We Read Now, and description across the disciplines. And as their title suggests, the last two of these volumes tackle epistemological issues in critical theory and literary practice. So needless to say that we are in for quite a treat today. So please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Patters Professors Patterson and Best. And now Orlando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marian. I still can't believe that our relationship goes back 30 years. <laughs> this, when, <laughs> this is when I first met you. And um, uh, thanks for having me over here uh, in Berkeley. Um, I also can't believe that this is my first visit here. Well, my second, last, the first one being when um, I attended the graduation of my daughter. But um, uh, it's always good to start sometime. <laughs> and I'm very happy about this, happy about um, the uh, engagement, which you've arranged. And I'm really looking forward, um, forward to um, these discussions, starting with today. Um, so I want to examine today uh, a subject which one of which I've been deeply involved with from the very beginning. Um, as Marion mentioned, my first book, uh, which was published way back in 1967, has been republished and um, recently and um, on slavery. And I found um, that's been um, a major preoccupation. And um, as the biographical um, dialogue, as it's called, um, which is the book that's coming out in a few weeks indicates, has been in many ways the existential and intellectual source of much of my thinking um, since then uh, on um, freedom, the nature of freedom, on slavery elsewhere, uh, on um, the problem of colonialism and of decolonization, and, uh, and also of course, the source of my literary writing, since um, my second novel was, in fact, based on the materials I collected in my first in my book uh, on slavery, and thinking that this material is too good to be buried away in historical sociology. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wrote a novel, um, and um, so today I am, uh, in a sense. Going um, back deeply into the subject of slavery, but also um, the subject which more recently I've become um, engaged with um, genocide. Of course, like all um, persons who engage in their society, genocide is a subject which I've always um, had an interest in, but that of a layman. I've um, <clears throat> acquired a scholarly interest at the beginning to, so forgive me if I, I'm wanting in some respects in the subject. Um, the, um, they've had separate research traditions, slavery and, um, and genocide. Um, but um, I've been pleasantly surprised to, to find that um, the gesture of joining the two of seeing their interaction has come from genocide scholars rather than slavery scholars. Surprising, one would have thought that um, students of slavery would have been more preoccupied with this um, subject, but it's been genocide scholars, as we'll see, um, who have become increasingly interested in history of slavery. Um, the, um, the occasionally scholars, historians, and so on have reflected on the extent to which the two institutions, these two horrors, are connected. Uh, but the issue remains contentious and understudied. 
um, the um, I must say I, there's a somewhat egotistical reason why I became involved when someone um, drew to my attention that um, the work of one of the um, really prominent um, genocide philosophers, Claudio Card, was brought to my attention, and I said um, uh, that in fact um, her one of her um, now most widely cited pieces um, drew um, rather heavily on um, the concept of social death in her attempt to define what is distinctive about genocide. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll address that later on today. So um, I, I, I thought I'd return the compliment and, um, um, and um, found when I got into the subject that it's something which I should have been involved in much earlier. Um, so I want to begin by summarizing um, what essentially um, slavery is all about. Um, and um, everyone thinks they know what slavery is, but um, you know, it's, um, it's like everyone knowing um, what uh, they think they know what sort of um, love is until they try to define it. Um, it, it, or I should say, that's a bad sort of metaphor. Um, <laughs> I should say, what evil is until they try to define it. Um, and um, the, um, I have, as some of you may know, defined it quintessentially as a form of social death, um, by which I mean that um, it's, um, it is um, a, um, First, it's three things, uh, a relation of total domination, one person by another. Um, this, this is unusual. Uh, most people are surprised to learn this, but total domination of one person by another. It's, you know, societies go to great length to, for, to, to prevent that by all kinds of um, means of containment, um, um, usually patron client relations, familial relations or what have you. There is domination, but there is some control uh, of one kind or another. Slavery is unusual in that um, it's the relationship with which um, total domination, subjection of one person to another is allowed. I mean, the closest, of course, is the sort of um, is ex are extreme marital relationships. Um, and um, it, the, the relationship between marriage and slavery is sort of disturbing. Um, as I pointed out in um, Slavery and Social Death, many of the rituals of domination in many cultures are derived from marital relationships. Um, the, um, the total domination often entails the right of life and death. No matter what the laws say, you, you, the U.S. is typical. You're, you're not allowed to kill your slave, but you could. In you know, almost every slaves kill, slaves were killed with impunity, and um, there are almost no cases of um, the many, many instances of slaves being killed uh, that this person was punished. Uh, the simple um, um, way of getting out is that you're allowed to punish someone, punish them severely. So, you know, accidents happen. So it's um, the right then of total domination, including the right of life and death, is one of the central principles, of which very few other institutions or relationships of this kind. Um, the um, slave, secondly, is... Um, um, is never a member of the society. I use the term native alienation to define that. Um, the slave is the ultimate outsider. Uh, they've been ripped from one society and brought into another, but not re-socialized in that society. And the idea exists among the term slaveholder class and their kin that the slave does not belong because the slave belongs to a person, to another, an object of belonging to another, so they have no right to belong. This is very important. I'm not saying, as many people have superficially sort of um, um, claimed that I'm saying the slave has no relations or no community. Of course, there's a slave community and what have you. Uh, but it's different. It's important to, um, that you're recognized as a member of your community. That goes with all kind of um, rights of birth. I call it natal alienation for that reason. There are certain rights of birth which every society recognizes uh, of someone belonging 
and um, and her, uh, her protections as a result of uh, the right to slave as the ultimately deracinated person uh, it is um, the um, uh, genealogical isolate. Because what this implies is that you have no ancestry, recognized ancestry or descendants. You're an isolated um, case in history. Um, and, um, the, and, and no sort of claims on one's um, uh, ancestors, including one's parents and including one's children uh, who can be ripped away from you. So I just think about it. It's important to, 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 to try to make sense of that idea. It's such a, an abominable thought that many people just pass over that. But you know, to think that you have no claims whatever on your children um, or on your ancestors, uh, however much you may love them, that is, the, 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 that is such an abomination that I think most people just pass over it without thinking of it. But, but I spend a lot of time thinking of what that what that implies. Just think about it in living terms. Um, the um, the uh, finally, it's a relation of degradation, and um, the um, the the I, it's it's important to recognize this too. The notion of dishonor. But a slave is someone who and their descendants, um, someone to whom one has no sort of, um, you know, um, respect, um, can be dishonored, spat upon, um, you know, insulted, raped, um, without redress. In many cultures, the whole, especially, it seems interesting, in very honorific cultures, like sort of um, the uh, medieval Germans and so on, um, the slave, Honor was uh, never recognized, it was more the master's honor that was recognized. A slave woman was raped, and you know, just the Germans had elaborate honorific system with their guilt, uh, went not to the slave, but the slave master who was the one who was being dishonored, uh, because the slave woman had no honor that should be recognized. But that, that has huge implications. Um, now, I've tried to um, bring home the idea um, to sort of my fellow social scientists um, more recently by looking at the, the, the work of um, psychologists and social psychologists who look at, at and try to define for us what it is to be human and, um, uh, and what are the fundamental um, you know, elements of being human um, person. And therefore, uh, for me, what in social death implies is in fact, the last of the assault and these fundamental things. I found um, Susan Fisk's work, to um, some extent, draws on the more famously known work by Maslow on hierarchy and needs, but her work I've found to be extremely um, uh, uh, valuable. And you know, she emphasizes five fundamental motives, which Maslow would call the needs uh, um, of being human. And the most fundamental being to belong, um, the opposite of which is nasal alienation. <laughs> um, to belonging, that is fundamental. And it's the foundation, interestingly, of all the other fundamental motives or needs of being human. The fact that you belong to a community, a society of some kind, relationships that are real, are meaningful, are recognized. That is a fundamental human motive. And loss of that always goes with terrible consequences for the person. Um, to be able to make sense of your world, the world in which you live. Um, this, 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 how can you make sense of a world in which um, uh, you, you, you bit, bit just think of all what it involves being a slave, not um, owning yourself. Uh, can you make a sense of a world in which you do not possess yourself? Uh, the, the idea of having some control, some little control and competence over one's life. So imagine getting up each morning and absolutely everything you do that day is determined by someone else. You have absolutely no say in what it is you'll be doing that day from morning until you go to bed. 
exhausted and you wake up the next morning and so it, no control whatever. Um, to view ourselves as worthy and improvable again. And, um, and, and this is a fundamental one, uh, easy to neglect, um, uh, that to trust others, to be able to trust. Um, to view the world as a place that facilitates group life, attachment, interdependence, and love. Um, slavery assaults, in, in, in social psychological terms, Social death may be defined as the assault and those five fundamental um, motives or needs and so on. And everything I've read about slavery indicates that that is uh, that's that, that's the case. Um, the um, this denial of one's humanity. Now again, <laughs> I have to pause and say that. This is how the society and the slaveholder and his uh, people, uh, our people, defines the situation. It has devastating consequences, but it does not necessarily mean that this is how the slave view themselves. And um, I've had a lot of problems with people who have written a lot of nonsense about this. I mean, um, in fact, my very first work, Sociology of Slavery, was an attempt to understand from the slaves' point of view what this meant um, and how they reacted to this. Um, and um, the, um, so to, to indicate that there was a slave community or that slaves loved their children or so on is, uh, is to miss the point entirely. Um, and um, the, um, so that's it. So genocide, I've tried to. Come to grips with what, what it what it is. Um, the um, the term, as you know, is coined by uh, Mencken, and um, in his response to um, the Holocaust, uh, which he defines as the crime as of destroying national, racial, or religious group. And um, as you know, the, the UN, nineteen forty eight, defined it in more precise terms in a legally binding document. Um, which has been ratified by over 149 states. So in this definition, genocide involves any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. That, by the way, please bear that in mind. It's, it's a very important one for me, as the, the arguments I make um, will point out, I repeat it, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcefully transferring children of the group to another group, okay? Um, now, the, the definition has become part of international uh, and general customer international law and is recognized by the International Court of Justice. However, almost every, every aspect of one of the def elements of this de definition has been contested by academics and genocide scholars. I was quite surprised. Again, this is a, you know, as a general educated person, I knew about the UN definition. What I didn't know that there's such contestation around what struck me as perfectly obvious sort of um, definition. But every one of these has been contested. Um, one key issue is that of intent, the issue of intent, which sort of genocide scholars spend a lot of time sort of thinking about. I've been fascinated with this debate. To what extent is it necessary for mass killing to be considered genocide, the intent to kill? Uh, the controversy intellectually, in many ways, goes back to Jean Paul Sartre, uh, who argued that there, um, uh, in, um, just in a way, disagreeing with that, as he disagreed with so much else. <laughs> and, uh, for example, he used the case of the American bombing and killing of thousands of civilians in Vietnam, which he considered genocide. And to argue um, the issue of intent became central to the, to the defense of America, um, 
however, the horrible the bombings, as you know, were, and however many Vietnamese may have lost their lives, it was never the intention of America to deliberately exterminate the Vietnamese people um, uh, because they were Vietnamese. Well, because just because they were communists, I guess. And that um, genocide emerges only with the targeted slaughter of a specific group. Um, another issue is the targeted killing of political groups, which again has generated a lot of um, uh, argument, which some exclude from the crime of genocide, while others strongly argue otherwise. Um, Stalin's nationalization of land and agricultural policy, which resulted in a mass starvation, deaths of some 5 million Russian peasants, Mao's Cultural Revolution, which resulted in the deaths of some 30 million Chinese people, um, um, are considered by many to be cases of genocide, but even more by many, even more as not, because partly the issue of intent, partly because uh, this is a political act. Uh, preventing people from reproducing, um, especially on a mass scale, is, um, is considered genocide, and I think that's an important element, um, as outlined in the UN um, Declaration. There's also the question of how many people must die for an atrocity to be considered genocide. In my view, actually, the murder of a single member of a group because of their group identity should be considered genocidal killing. Um, a good example of this, is, um, is the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. So this is very puzzling. I mean, you know, white cops have been killing black people by the hundreds over a long period of time. Why did this act generate the response that it did, not only in America, but globally? And a simple answer is that it was, it was, it was quintessentially genocidal. There was someone being slowly killed because they were black. And I mean, and I think it, that, that it, 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 they happened quietly without the camera and so on. But seeing that act just brought home in a vivid way what genocide is. And um, this is, well, at least that's my explanation for the extraordinary response. It was global. Well, what, what was going on? It's that feeling, that gut feeling that this is a different kind of killing. Um, this is genocide. The um, and it is a question of cultural genocide, or what I maybe call ethnocide. I mean, when you use that term, many people who um, I, I, I said um, uh, work in, in genocide studies uh, are preoccupied with the destruction of a people's culture. This was already indicated, by the way, in Raphael Lemkin's um, um, famous. A definitive um, study. Uh, it's become to occupy a central place in the work of one of the leading philosophers of genocide, the late feminist philosopher in Wisconsin, Claudia Card, whose use of um, the concept of social death, as I said earlier, part of responsible for my engagement with the subject. For Card, social death is what distinguishes genocide from other forms of mass killing. This is how she sums up her argument. She says that this, 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 this it develops the hypothesis that social death is utterly central to the evil of genocide. Not just when a genocide is primarily cultural, but even when it is homicidal on a massive scale. It is social death that enables us to distinguish the peculiar evil of genocide from the evils of other mass murders, she claims. Even genocidal murders can be viewed as extreme means to the primary end of social death. Social vitality exists through relationships, contemporary and intergenerational, uh, that creates an identity that gives meaning to life. That's such a lovely short definition of social death in a way. Uh, I feel sometimes that I, I, I want to use that as the summary of it. Uh, Major loss of social vitality is a loss of identity and consequently a serious loss of meaning for one's existence. Putting social death at the center takes a focus off individual choice, individual goals and individual careers and body counts. 
and puts it on relationships that create community and set the context that gives meaning to choices and goals. If my hypothesis is correct, the term cultural genocide, she said, is probably both redundant and misleading. Redundant if the social death is present in all genocide implies cultural death as well. And misleading if cultural genocide suggests that some genocides do not involve cultural death. That's it's a sort of, um, I, I was just fascinated by this. They've read it repeatedly over and over, and, um, and it's generated a lot of argument, um, uh, disagreements, and uh, as well as um, implementary studies. Um, and um, I, um, the um, cultural and physical actions that prevent reproduction um, amount a form of genocide. Indeed, this may be the worst form of genocide today. And this is another idea which I've become very, another evil in the world which I've become very involved with and got into from my study of, um, you know, of the, um, the problems that I, um, that, that I'm teaching uh, now, and it's, um, it may be the worst form of genocide today. And um, I refer here to the crime of genocide, which ironically is only mildly punished in some societies, and it's not illegal in most Western societies, including the US. So all this genocide, it's remarkable that I have to define it once, what it is since, Many have not heard of it. Uh, most of my students in, in my trafficking course, I mean, I've never heard of the idea. Even though it involves millions of deaths, or at least elimination. Gendercide refers to the deliberate killing of individuals based on their gender, or the selective prevention of the birth of fetuses of a particular gender. Okay. In most cases, females are targeted. The term androcide is sometimes used by some to refer to the targeted killing of males. The UN estimates that, and the US, the United Nations has come to take this very seriously. It's a very recent development uh, recognizing this as a crime. Um, the UN, which recognizes it, it began, by the way, I should give him credit, Amartya Sen was the first major scholar to really bring to attention in a famous, now famous piece published in the New York Review of Books on it. Um, the UN estimates that at a minimum, there are 140 missing women in the world as of 2020. Now, try to get your head around that. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but we're talking big numbers here. And um, the deliberate intentional prevention of the birth of a hundred, or the killing in the case of pure infanticide, which goes on on a large scale in many parts of the world, but mainly now um, of 120 million women, genocide. Is, uh, now, I, I, it, as you see, this is very important. Um, to the argument I made earlier, but it ties into the idea, the centrality of the idea of preventing reproduction as something I want to, if I leave one idea with you, I want it to be clear, preventing the reproduction of a group is, 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 um, amounts to um, genocide. Um, the, um, now, the reason why it's so recent is that it exploded somewhere about 19, uh, the, the, the 1980s. And um, the, um, the reason being, now, you know, in history, girls have always been um, um, killed or abandoned. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, the crisis that came in the Roman slave system at the end of um, the Republic and the early empire uh, with the Roman peace. Uh, there are no more slaves from outside. And there's a big question of where did the Romans sort of get their slaves from, which have been on for several more centuries. And um, as you know, Max Weber, famous um, 
discussion of this, but the, the wise man was wrong on that. Um, and most of them came from abandoned birds. So uh, thousands and thousands of them. So it's, it's an ancient practice, but it's become far greater now than anything in the ancient world, even the Roman world, who at least didn't kill them, abandoned them, and most of them actually got taken up and used as slaves. With a technological development, the ability to identify the gender of um, the fetus, which is a very expensive proposition until about 1980s, when in fact it became very cheap to do that. So today, for about $25, an Indian, uh, Pakistani, or whatever um, a woman can identify. The gender of the fetus, and often um, the, it's made illegal in. Uh, it's illegal in India. Uh, it's not illegal, by the way, in the United States. Uh, but it's made illegal in India because it became such a major issue. It's illegal in China too, where it's big. Um, but um, uh, it doesn't have much effect because you know there are other reasons why you may find out accidentally from your. Um, gynecologist, what the gender is, and especially if the gynecologist knows that you're very eager to know what the gender is, you can just let it drop. So it's it's led to an explosion in Korea. And the thing is, we can measure this quite accurately. This is the other interesting thing. Because of a demographic constant, we know the ratio of males to females birth in nature. And so just look at the difference between what should be the case uh, in terms of um, gender ratio, uh, and, and, um, and you can calculate quite accurately how many women have been terminated. Um, so, um, and so it's very interesting that it's not illegal in the United States. There is a stop gendercide um, clause in the um, trafficking clause, but not, not many people take it very seriously. Uh, okay. Um, there, um, there have been um, uh, studies, as I said, of um, the subject um, and one uh, of slavery and um, genocide. But one interesting the, um, aspect of this, which I want to um, um, point out, is um, the degree to which. Um, uh, um, The um, the what well, ethnocide or cultural um, genocide is um, is exists um, and um, uh, card in a sense has made it very important. But as I pointed out in an earlier um, uh, slide, um, I prefer. To maintain the distinction, and as much as I greatly admire her work, all genocide in terms involves some kind of ethnocide, but not all ethnocide entails death, murder. Now, some extreme form of ethnocide do amount to genocide. And there's a case which is now very much in the news the ethnocide of um, Native American children which the Pope has given his formal definition of as genocide. He, he went to Canada, he asked forgiveness, and he defined it as genocide, which is in a way taking Card's position. Um, the, um, okay, um, the, um, I, um, I'd, my position then is that all forms of genocide involves um, ethnocide, but you can have ethnocide without gen um, genocide. And the distinction I'm going to draw um, between Jamaica and the US sort of rests on that. And I'd love to hear your response um, to that. Um, there's been um, work which I've um, looked at um, in. Um, uh, recent works on trying to compare slavery and, and genocide. As I said, it's come mainly from genocide scholars. Um, the, um, the, the basic distinction, to cut the long story short, um, 
is the, to emphasize that um, genocide involves killing people, whereas um, ethnocide does not necessarily um, involve that. Um, and these are some works which I, I, I'll, I'll skip over uh, the, um, the um, details. We can talk about it in, um, in, in the discussion. Um, very good works. I mean, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the work um, on Kaplan's work, I found extremely valuable. It's now become a classic between dignity and despair. And um, Kaplan is one of the earliest persons to use slavery and social death because she basically argues that the period of the thir both 33 and, um, and uh, 40 or so, for her constitute a period of social death of the Jews. That's her basic argument. Uh, whereas um, the genocide, in a sense, um, begins with the death camps and so on. So she, she marked that and um, a significant difference. So she's taking the view that you, you could call the period of the 30s um, in Nazi Germany an ethnocidal one, as opposed to the beginning of a genocide. Um, and um, the, the same goes for um, Danny's um, um, work on um, it was willing executioners who also uses the concept of social death to make that distinction. So it's become, it's become almost commonplace now that um, that it's a purposeful killing it marks the difference. Um, the others have disagreed, and um, uh, such as vessels of evil and so on. So I can um, I should mention one work, early or work, which generated huge amount of controversy, which did compare um, the um, concentration camps with American slavery. And that's Stanley Elkins's book on slavery, which came out way back, 59. But so early, I used it in my thesis. Um, uh, yes, so you long ago, that was right. <laughs> it's a measure of antiquity <laughs> when Patterson wrote his thesis. Um, that um, the work, what Elkins did was to um, argue that Drawing on several um, accounts by survivor, survivors of the concentration camp, um, including several Freudians and psychologists who were um, who have been um, escaped the camp, um, um, he found that the descriptions of the relationship between the concentration camp inmates and the concentration camp guards uh, was one of a kind of um, utter dependence and what he called childlike attachment. And um, the, and the Zif argued was the characteristic of total institutions, what he called total institutions, total domination of one person by another. Of the people, the threat of life, with the um, possibility of life and death. Um, and Elkins found parallels between this utter dependence and uh, like attachment and, um, and, and the sambo, between the sambo type personality, which is describing countless accounts of US slavery by slave owners writing about the characters, the character of the Black Americans, the, 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 the stereotypes and the psychological relation between Jewish inmates and their owners. And, um, and the, um, the um, Bruno Bettelheim, most famously, uh, of course, and um, um, written on this, and I think he drew heavily on Bettelheim's account to claim that there is some core of truth in this, in this psychology that what total institutions reduce you to is a kind of um, childlike sort of um, dependence and attachment. It refers to the thing that some concentration camp inmates would take pieces of the um, inmates' clothes and hold on to it. Um, and um, so, well, as you can imagine, you're all too young, maybe to remember the storm of controversy, which, which came in response to Elkins's book. 
And um, it was, um, uh, you know, after being greeted with some excitement and so on, Elkins is a fine historian, I should say. It was sort of um, uh, thrown to this sort of dash heap of historiography and uh, never to be heard of again, <laughs> except by a few curious people like um, Orlando Patterson. And so, I mean, I, um, well, I, I had to read it from my dissertation, so I was thoroughly absorbed it. But it, it's, um, it, it, it's a fascinating work. And um, it, it's, um, I don't, you know, I, in the criticism of Elkins, and I was part of that, a famous book came out criticizing Elkins, written, which is a chapter from the sociology of slavery, which is critical of Elkins' use. But my argument was not to, throw it in the wastebasket, but to argue that, in fact, from my comparative study of slavery, I did find, I did find that everywhere that slavery existed, you found from the slave owners' accounts, accounts which are very similar to Sambo all across the world. My most famous example of that comes from um, uh, the Latin literature on on slavery in, in ancient Rome. And the Roman elite's attitude towards their slaves summarize a perfect summary of this. It's called Graculus. Graculus is, the, 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 you could almost, you could use Sambo to the, the, to, to the fine guy. Now, it, this is re reference to the typical slave. Ironically, <laughs> it was a Greek, the Greek household. And, uh, but the Roman's description of their slaves uh, we, and it's interesting, a racial type became identified with the Reculus refers to um, Greek, the Greek slaves, who so, so dominated the households and so on, was that they were sambas. And so my argument is that, yes, this existed every, quite likely in, in the knowledge. But what does it mean? What, what, what did it mean to the slaves? And so on my, so my Christian wasn't to, to claim that this is not true, this is just made up. There clearly was something in it. The question is, what was it in it? Uh, what was real in it? And um, and my argument was, and I found, by the way, exactly similar thing in um, in Jamaica. Um, it is called Kwashi. And as with the Roman use of the term miraculous, using a racial type of Greek, um, the um, Kwashi is the three three um, name. Um, uh, uh, for um, the day name for a, a slave, um, uh, and Kwashiba. And so, and Kwashi was very similar in the descriptions, or identical almost to Sambo, and both were very similar to Graculus. <laughs> so, so, what is going on in those things? What are the owners trying? Was this total made up and so on? And my argument is that it, it, it is a form of psychological warfare, if you like, between slave and slave owner, that the slave was um, simulating this, that the slave was uh, making, giving the master what the master wanted to see as a way of manipulating the master. Uh, but the problem is, uh, if you play that game too often, what does it do to you eventually? So, a bit tricky, some, uh, but um, uh, this, um, okay, so, um, the, the most of the works you see here, one of the problems I have with it, including Elkins, is that, well, not Elkins, Elkins is specifically related to America, is that it takes a too monolithic view of um, slavery. That slavery varied a lot um, and um, from one part of the Americas to another. And um, I, um, the, the variations due to, you know, patterns of ownership, proportion of number of slaves owned by the typical owner and uh, money mission rates. And by the way, one important thing to remember is that, the, you know, American scholarship um, is so dominant and that very often American scholars end up assuming that what's the norm in the U.S. is the norm everywhere. I, I've been driving people crazy all over by pointing out that this kind of parochialism has got to stop. I mean, I mean, I, it, it, it's not. It's, it, I, I first noted it in, in, as a graduate student in slave studies, and when I came to the, uh, at first reading the established works, the U.S. slave was the norm, 
And so you get a work like Tannenbaum and so on, which is sort of very concerned with why is it that the, um, the slavery in, um, in Latin America was so different from the law, when in fact, the question is always the other way around. I mean, you know, why was the U.S. so, so different? Um, for example, in manumission, um, Tannenbaum wanted to know why did a, why did this Latin slave uh, owners manumit such a high proportion of slaves? The assumption being that the norm is very small <laughs> manumission rate. It was the other way around. Most large-scale slave societies have high rates of manumission. It's a major way of containing the system. But anyway. That um, the, the but so I want to um, use two major slave societies then, which we want to look at um, um, Jamaica and um, the U.S. South um, as two paradigmatic systems. Okay, uh, they're both plantation systems that originated in the British imperialism, and the slaveholder classes both came from Britain. And until about 1776, they were also part of the British Empire. Uh, the scale of ownership differed. The average ownership was about only about 10 slaves in the US. The average in America, Jamaica was about 100 slaves on a typical large plantation. Uh, in the US, the majority of people were free and white. In Jamaica, from the early 18th century, from about 1710, also, the vast majority were black and enslaved. The slave population outnumbering um, the free by over 10 to 1, and uh, blacks outnumbering whites by 12 to 1 by about 1730 or so. For whites who survived tropical diseases, however, Jamaica was a source of great wealth. Jamaica was the Saudi Arabia of the 18th century, it's hard to believe. Um, the um, uh, more there, more wealth was generated in Jamaica than all the 13 colonies put together. Um, the, and if you look at just the trade figures, Britain had more trade with this one little island than all of North America, right up to near the end of the 18th century. That's how so important it is. Um, the fundamental difference between the two systems was the survival rate of the black populations. In America, the planter class from very early calculated that it made economic sense um, to encourage re the reproduction of their slave population. Okay? A decision encouraged by the cheaper cost of food in the US, whereas a large free farming population and abundant land. As uh, we'll see the kind of crops they grew, tobacco and later cotton, also made a reproductive slave strategy more profitable. This is in sharp contrast to Jamaica, where the sugar crop and slave trade led to the slaveholding class to an economic calculation in which reproduction was seen as too costly and a waste of time and a waste of money and was replaced by one in which young Africans were bought, worked mercilessly, with little concern for their welfare. If you could keep them alive for eight years, you not only reproduce, get your, um, um, what you paid for them, but make a handsome profit. Um, death was everywhere in, in Jamaican society, as I show in this sociology of slavery and in this literary sequel, Die the Long Day. The physical death they tried to shun, the social death that they could not. Uh, and um, I use the term protracted or slow moving genocide to explain the demographic and social situation of the black population in Jamaica during the period of British slavery from 1655 to about 1838. And this is not a metaphor. And um, with the data from the Atlantic slave trade database now available, it's possible to calculate. Uh, more precisely, um, the um, the death rate, the death toll in Jamaican slavery, using a simple counterfactual strategy, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Then to do that, we need another slave society that shows what might have been possible. The counterfactual had the British 
brutal vast and in Jamaica not pursue the demographic strategy of buying mercilessly over exploiting and replacing their slaves from the slave trade. The demographic experience of the ethnocidally enslaved in North America provides such a counterfactual case. So I'm seeing America as a classic case of ethnocide on a grand scale. Uh, Jamaica as ethnocide and genocide, or protracted genocide. This is my basic argument. There have been many very good recent um, comparisons of Jamaica and the US. Richard Dunn, the historian, perhaps um, in um, this brilliant meso level demographic analysis of these, what he called two radically different systems of action uh, and, and um, systems in action. Why did I say of action? I'm still thinking of Parsons at the back of my mind. Uh, wherein the Jamaican planters treated the enslaved as, quote, disposable cogs in a machine, importing slaves from Africa, working them too hard, feeding them too little, exposing them to debilitating diseases, and routinely importing new Africans to replace those who died, unquote. That was the situation in Jamaica for nearly all its history. In contrast to the demographic growth of the enslaved in Virginia. Now, to be sure, the American slaveholders were no angels, okay? I mean, this is an economic calculation we're talking about, all right? And in fact, there's an easy way of showing that they weren't in angels. If you could find a situation if they're similar to the Jamaican situation, what would they have done? And we have such a situation, sort of, um, there's a lot of counterfactuals one can uh, in, use in the study of slavery. And one comes to the, the historian, um, Tadman, um, who, um, who has shown um, that um, if you go to the one exception to the cotton kingdom in America, uh, Louisiana, where what, they were, what were they growing? Cane you found a similar demographic strategy, similar to what you found in Jamaica, right? So, um, and they were merciless there uh, too. And um, Tadman so did a brilliant job um, at that. Um, so he, um, the, the, the reproductive choices made easy for them by virtue of the fact that the crops on which they made their wealth was not sugar indeed. And uh, where there were sugar planters, they acted just as viciously inhumane as in Jamaica. Now, there are arguments against this counterfactual strategy, which um, I considered at some length in uh, the published version of this. Um, and um, the, um, the one is that epidemiological factors prevented such a reproductive strategy uh, in Jamaica. And um, in that, um, it's, um, um, and it's easy to dismiss that uh, by looking at the case of Barbados, where a similar West Indian slave society actually succeeded in reproducing their slaves. Um, one group of one set of historians, um, the um, the um, Zaga that has blamed the breastfeeding habits of West African women for <laughs> the difference that because West African women tend to have long periods of um, breastfeeding that that led to um, uh, lower reproduction this is nonsense. I mean, actually it, it comes from a historian whom I actually um, like very much, much of his work and that's Stang Engelman, uh, but it's just a ridiculous argument. In fact, modern studies uh, have indicated that the long period of breastfeeding makes a lot of sense, indeed, especially in a brutal environment, because the longer period in which, you know, um, you, uh, you know, feeding the, 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 the child a long period of time is provide more nourishment than a horrible um, nourishment being provided on the plantation. And perhaps the best response is that right after slavery was abolished, the population um, uh, reproduction rate started rising almost immediately. The African lactation practices had nothing to do with this. This was just a brutal, brutal sort of regime. Um, the, um, uh, so, 
And I cut, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to go into the, 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 the details of um, this in, in the discussion, uh, but I, 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 I won't. Um, we, can, we can talk about that later on. Um, uh, but the basic argument then is that this is a deliberate strategy. Now, what are its consequences? So, um, the, um, let me just give you an idea of uh, one thing to note is the incredible, I'll get back to this uh, in, in a minute. Um, the, um, this, um, if we look at um, these two fig figures I'm going to show you, what, I, did I miss something here? Um, okay. Um, the, um, the proportion of um, slaves um, who came to Jamaica as opposed to those who came to America. And you know, it's, it's just staggering. Most people are just not aware of it and are prepared to be shocked or, or to, 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 to not believe what you're seeing. Um, if you look at um, these two figures, um, the, the, this figure and this one um, here, um, you just take my word for it. We can go in, in greater details. Um, the um, the relative proportion of slaves taken to Jamaica, and North America, mainland uh, between 1651, which is just a little before the British took over the island, and 1830, which is just before the end of slavery in Jamaica. Um, the between 1651 and 1660, North America received far more, far far more. Um, so, um, far less slaves than Jamaica. Um, and um, sorry, let me repeat that. Between 1651 and 1655, North America actually received far more slaves than Jamaica. But in 1655, when the British took over, we had a different story. Essentially, between five and 10 times more slaves were delivered in Jamaica than to North America during the six decades after 1660. So let me just show you um, something here. Um, the, um, I think uh, maybe one way to do this is uh, I need to get to maybe escape here. Um, I want to get to the one behind there. Um, so, so if, yeah, there we go. I um, should bring it all the way up. So let's just, some, some of you have seen this, I gather. It's a, it's um yep. It's uh, no this this is thank you very much. Um so here um we have this is a you know this is based this is not a simulation by the way. Oops, I'm gonna um can you help me with this? Um bring, this is not a simulation, this is based on real data and um the slave trade. And um, each dot is a slave ship, and it's a real ship with real numbers. So if I um, if 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 I sort of um, bring this up here, okay, let's and it just just look at you now. You see where you know where Jamaica is. Some of you may have gone there on holidays, and it's 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 it's, it's, it's up there. Uh, it's that it's this tiny little island here, and of course you know where North America is. It's all of this, okay. And what I'm saying is that um, so many more slaves went to this little island, and it's powerfully um, reflected in in, um, in in this diagram um, in, in in this graphic. Um, let's see. Um, can I? Um, Mac PC battle. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I need to. So just look at where th those little dots are going. You see how few go to America. Um, just look at that. Okay, so, and they are all going there. Look, uh, eventually they start going to South um, America. We're we're up to about sixteen, eight years, seventeen hundred. We're at seventeen hundred. Just look at that. It shows, and as I said, you know, um, we um, if we stop 
um, and look, uh, we can sort of each, we have the data on each ship and the numbers taken. It's just a fantastic um, data base, right? And the, um, so, um, and um, so let's carry on. Now we're at about 1700. Um, and let's go up to um, uh, about 1760 or so, the height of the Jamaica. Just look at that. Um, the, how many, you see the, the, <laughs> this little island? I just find it's a very powerful sort of um, image. Um, and, um, and so on. And they start going to um, Brazil and so on. But the, um, Okay, thank you very much again. But it's, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. So, um, so the last decades of the 18th century and more, so, um, between five and 10 times more slaves were delivered to Jamaica than to all of North America during the six decades after 1660. And during the last decades of the 18th century and more than twice as many in the middle decades um, century. And um, the, um, if this figure here shows the, um, figure, the cumulative effect in absolute numbers, okay? Between 1650 and 1830, a total uh, let's see, of um, over, um, over a million Africans were taken to Jamaica, while well, only 388,233 Africans were taken to the United States during that entire period. Just think about a little island uh, about one fifth the size of California. Uh, the, the, what happened to them? What is going on? <laughs> um, the, but in 1830, at the end of the period, we find over 2 million enslaved Africans in America, and including free blacks a total of 2.3 million blacks were in the United States from that number up to 388,000 total. At the same time, only 319,000 enslaved blacks were in Jamaica and 357 you took into account the mixed black population. So my argument is very simple one, simple counterfactual one. Had Africans and their descendants experienced the same rate of increase as the US, the 1830 black population of Jamaica should have been 5.26 million. And its total, including freed blacks, should have been a little over 6 million. Okay. Taking account of the 359 survivors, the 9,000 in 1830, with the US then, this counterfactual, we find that there were 5.7 million missing black people in Jamaica. And that's the extent of the genocide, I'm arguing. If one accepts the fact that prevention of reproduction, of brutalization um, of a population to prevent them from reproducing, constitute genocide. This is real genocide. Okay. Um, and um, it's um, uh, now um, it's the measure I said of physical genocide in addition to the ethnocide. Uh, so I distinguish them between two kinds of genocide. Art, um, the the what they call concentrated and protracted. I'll use the term concentrated genocide to explain the experience of the Jews in Nazi Germany. Protracted genocide to explain the almost six million people who disappeared or did not reproduce uh, in Jamaica. 
The second, a Jewish physical destruction is concentrated over a period of four years. In Jamaica, it lasts from one into three. And in the case of the Jews who are actually living bodies destroyed, and there's a lot of destruction of physical bodies in Jamaica, I can tell you. Uh, lots of places are killed, beaten to death, so on, died on the treadmill. But apart from these murders, shortened lives, um, we're talking about shortened lives, potential lives, which were preventively eliminated. And um, they, um, in my novel, Die the Long Day, in which I went over this thing, but from a fictive point of view, uh, looking at slave plantation on a single day in which a woman was killed um, at the uh, um, command of the people after she, she attempted to kill the slave owner. Um, um, and at the funeral, the, the novel took place over the course of the day of the funeral. And in Jamaica, um, there is a custom of carrying the cops, where um, it's, it's, it's actually a West African custom, which again very, very important in Jamaica, um, where deaths were celebrated. And um, the cops is carried. And um, people would say goodbye and give gifts and so on. And so, um, to take messages back to West Africa, and so on. And um, what is a period of celebration? Death was a cause for celebration. Happiest day of your life. And I had. Uh, character, slightly deranged, panty woman. And I this thing I'm going to show you, I, I, um, um, singing a dirge, her version of a fanti dirge. A fanti is a tribe in West, um, people in, in Ghana from which a substantial number of Jamaicans came. And this is um, the dirge. Do not say anything, oh mother, sister, do not say anything, for anything you say will be too much, and nothing you say will be enough. But I thought, just very powerful, it sums up the banality of evil and the impossibility of ultimately understanding and making sense. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orlando, for this brilliant lecture. So we are really... Uh, behind so i hope that you will that uh, another you know we will take another another 15 20 minutes however it takes first of all we want to to hear uh, steven's comments um and then you know we will tr try to end this uh, uh probably about 15 minutes after thank you marian <clears throat> can everyone hear me okay okay thank you professor patterson um both for that amazing paper uh, and also for traveling to Berkeley to be with us. Uh, thank you uh, to Marianne as well for inviting me to respond. Um, I'm really honored to respond. Uh, my auntie in Barbados is very impressed that I'm responding to the illustrious <laughs> Orlando Patterson. So um, uh, uh, Professor Patterson has given us a very uh, thorough sort of account of his um, uh, transformative work, Slavery and Social Death, a Comparative Study from 1982. I came of age intellectually during a period when that concept of social death had a huge influence on the field of slavery studies in both its humanistic and social science aspects. And I think Professor Patterson was thinking about some of this work um, in his um, um, side remarks. Um, I'm thinking about the work of Ian Balcom, Stephanie Smallwood, Saidiya Hartman. Um, this is work that has often been criticized for um, in precisely the ways that Professor Patterson has um, given us, um, conflating a kind of exposition of slaveholding ideology with a description of the actual condition of the enslaved, um, mistaking a theoretical abstraction um, that comes from a breathtaking study of 66 slaveholding societies um, reducing that, that to uh, um, 
a description of the life of the enslaved. Now, P Professor Patterson's influence on my own work and thought does not lie in slavery and social death. It actually li lies in a less celebrated essay that he published in 1972 on that was critical of the way the legacy of slavery had shaped Black American identity. This is an essay called Toward a Future That Has No Past, Reflections on the Fate of Blacks in the Americas. More on that shortly. So in the talk he's given us today, Slavery and Genocide, the US, Jamaica, and the Historical Sociology of e Evil, Patterson, and um, pardon me for referring to you in the third person, um, uh, or referring to you by your last name, I'll refer to you, I'll refer to you, uh, I'll address you directly at the very end. Um, Patterson explores uh, the use of, so it just feels weird when the person sitting right next to you, referring to them by their last name. Orlando. Okay. Without being uh, disrespectful. Um, uh, Patterson explores the use of social death by genocide scholars. Um, rather than the future that has no past, Patterson sets out to project the future of a, of a particular past. That is, he sets out to imagine how Black Jamaicans would have existed were it not for the slow rolling genocide that was Jamaican slavery. To see Jamaican slavery as a genocidal act requires the careful stitching together of academic work on either side of the slavery genocide analogy, particularly the uses to which the concept of social death has been put in, in fine tuning that analogy. The problem begins with the definition of genocide, a term coined in the mid 40s. Questions of intent, as he's shown us, have been central to deliberations over genocide, as have concerns with ethnic and political group identity and numerical measures of harm, body counts versus the destruction of a, pe of a people's culture and community. The feminist philosopher Cardia Card was one of the first genocide scholars to use the concept of social death to respond to these disputes and Professor Patterson sort of summarized her work um, elegantly for us. One of the first historians to explore the connection between slavery and genocide was Stanley Elkins in the book, Slavery, A Problem of American Institutional and Intellectual Life, which was published in 1959. The term genocide had often been, um, had only been coined in the previous decade Certainly, the nuances of the definition of genocide hadn't yet been worked out by academics and genocide scholars, but I also imagine that the Nazi Holocaust, at the time a matter of living memory, was for that reason hard to analogize to other experience, which might explain some of the harsh re resistance to Elkin's propose, proposal of a, similar, a similarity between the American slave and the Jewish inmate. Whatever the case, Patterson sees a continued lack of nuance in the slavery side of the equation, asserting that genocide scholars have taken, taken a too monolithic view of New World slavery and failed to differentiate between slavery in the US South and slavery in Jamaica. These aren't simply types of slavery, but in some respects, the extremes, one in which it made economic sense to encourage the reproduction of the slave population and one in which it did not. Drawing on data, from the Atlantic Slave Trade Database, Patterson asks that we entertain a clever and compelling thought experiment, that American slavery is the counterfactual to Jamaican slavery. Now, because I'm trained to think about form and my mind comes alive when I encounter ideas with a hint of literariness, I'll focus my comments on the counterfactual and on Patterson's use of the form. Um, and so, my responses are specifically to the the the, the argument in the the paper, um, um, the language of the paper, um, specifically the language as it relates to the counterfactual. So the OED defines counterfactual statements as quote pertaining to or expressing what has not in fact happened but might could or would in different conditions. Such statements often assume the form of a conditional assertion which consist, again, this is from the OED, of two categorical clauses, the former of which expressing a condition introduced by if or equivalent word is called the antecedent, the latter stating the conclusion is called the consequent. 
The counterfactual is a form favored by armchair historians, those who like to speculate what would have happened to America had JFK not been assassinated or what would have happened had Europe not vanquished Hitler. As Catherine Gallagher observes in her recent book, Telling It Like It Wasn't, The Counterfactual Imagination in History and Fiction, the form has a long history. It has its origins in military histories, specifically the histories of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, um, uh, um, military histories of France and Prussia. The Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz, one of the earliest adherents, felt that counterfactual speculation gave one the ability to gain knowledge from the past for the sake of future planning. We're perhaps most familiar with its appearance in fiction and popular culture, time travel narratives. One of my favorites is a novel entitled Black in Time, published in, the in 1970, in which black scholars use a secret invention called the Nexus apparatus to travel back in time and confirm the blackness of certain horse historical figures. This, of course, anodyne project goes awry and they start intervening in history. Um, um, some things that happen in that novel, uh, uh, um, uh, the scholars, as they're traveling back, intervene in the exchange of food and slaves between settlers in Jamestown and the crew of a distressed Dutch ship, the sort of origin of um, North American slavery in 1619. We also encounter the form in legal, in legal cases, specific, particularly cases in which a broad remedy is sought. Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education, Bakke versus the Regents of the University of California, all are cases that draw on the counterfactual form. The legal theorists H.L.A. Hart and A.M. Honoré observed in their book, Causation in the Law, that the legal counterfactual tries to answer two simple questions. First, would Y have occurred if X had not occurred? And second, is there any principle which precludes the treatment of Y as the consequence of X for legal purposes? Why have everyone from military historians to human rights lawyers found the counterfactual useful? Why take the mode seriously? The counterfactual offers logical scenarios that self-consciously attempt to re-articulate the relation between past and present. When used to decouple the actual present from the historical past, the counterfactual can serve the ends of historical activism, assigning praise or blame to historical actors, exploring the role of human agency and, and responsibility in history, satisfying the ambition to shape history rather than merely record it, affording comparative assessments of history. Alternate histories, civil rights cases, demands for reparations, international justice movements. Gallagher notes how these projects converge on the idea that, quote, to change the status quo in the present, we should try to imagine what sort of past could have led to a present we'd like to inhabit and a future we could whole, wholeheartedly desire, end of quote. And in that, in the book, um, uh, 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 telling it like it wasn't, um, um, Gallagher's very interested in different forms of the counterfactual. Um, counterfactual histories, um, alternative hist counterfactual histories, which are largely an analytical works, such as histories of wars, economic crises that explore multiple possibilities that went unrealized. Alternate histories, which describe a kind of continuous sequence of departures from a his, the historical record. Um, and then alternate history novels, which use fictional characters to kind of flesh out the social and other consequences of alternate realities. But all of these forms kind of um, adhere to what she calls a kind of counterfactual historical mode, which she defines in these terms, quote, an explicit or implicit past tense, hypothetical conditional conjuncture pursued when the antecedent condition is known to be contrary to fact, end of quote. So I apologize for providing this potted history of the counterfactual form, but I think it gives us language to place Patterson's use of the form. His, isn't, his use of the counterfactual isn't clearly within any one of these categories. Rather, he draws on a variety of, um, of tools available through the counterfactual. Works in the counterfactual historical mode adhere to a number of conventions, and it's these conventions I want to kind of use to then ask some questions about counterfactual thinking in this paper. Um, 
um, I want to ask whether these kind of conventions apply in the case of Patterson's counterfactual. So first convention, counterfactual histories and alternate histories tend to deploy a discrete sense of the event, spinning out departures from the historical record based on very calculated changes to specific events, events sharply bounded in time. Second, counterfactualists, as Gallagher observes, tend to vary events while holding historical entities constant. So they tend to assume that the entities are identical, right? The persons, the armies, the governments in our actual history remain constant, even though their destinies, the totality of what they think, do, and suffer are changed. Now seems a right, the right moment then to return to the slavery genocide analogy. Why does the analogy between slavery and genocide make more sense in Patterson's formulation than it did in Elkins's? I would argue it has something to do with the counterfactual historical mode and the more recent developments in the form. Given these developments and the affinity of social and international justice movements for the form, it should come as no surprise that Patterson chooses to explore the comparison between slavery and genocide within the framework of a counterfactual thought experiment. Interestingly, Patterson, Patterson stretches the parameters of the counterfactual historical mode in ways that raise provocative questions for the kind of in, kinds of intellectual work the counterfactual can do. So here's where I address you um, uh, and not um, Orlando Patterson. I have two sets of questions for you, and I hope you don't mind if I address them to you directly. Um, the second question actually has is a response to the written conclusion of your paper. So I hope you don't mind if I read the written conclusion before I ask your question. Um, so the first, um, you expand the time horizon of the event in the antecedent condition in your counterfactual, right? While you while the Jewish physical elimination, as you put it, was concentrated over a short period of five years, and I think we saw that in the slide, you acknowledge that the British genocide of Blacks in Jamaica took place over 183 years, quote, in the drip, drip, drip of shortened lives and curtailed fertility, close quote. You can see that in Raphael Lemkin's classic statement of genocide, he cautions that it be viewed as a process over time rather than an event. I wouldn't dispute that, but I would like to hear you reflect on the role that big data has played in making 200 years appear plausible as an event horizon for the act of genocide. The second question, or the second sort of set of thoughts responds to the final page um, of your paper, this 183 years. Um, so uh, if, 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 if I'll be allowed, I'll, I'll, I'll read that, those final two paragraphs because they shaped what I, how, I, how, I, how I responded to the larger paper. You wrote, when British slavery was finally abolished in 1838, Jamaicans had experienced it for 183 years. The island has never fully recovered from the uniquely violent decimation of that first half of its history. Dan Stone has written, one of the characteristics of traumatic memory is that it cannot be suppressed at will, and societies remain scarred long after its experience. The Prime Minister of Jamaica, Honorable Andrew Holness, in his 2021 Emanci Day, Emancipation Day speech commemorating the abolition of slavery in the island, noted that it had been 183 years since abolition and the role that the last great rebellion of the enslaved, the led by national hero Samuel Sharp, played in bringing it about. But then he added something with which his entire nation would have somberly agreed, quote, the use of violence has followed us from our history, end of quote. Today, you write, Jamaica remains one of the most violent nations in the world, as it was in the 18th century, with a homicide rate that places it in the top five of all nations, and a rate of femicide, the murder of women, consistently at the very top of the world's nations. The dead yards of the nation's slums bear ghoulish witness to the plantation dead, dead yards of that first half of its existence. For Jamaica, and I think you're quoting Dan Stone here again, the politics of post-genocidal memories are matters of life and death. So then my second response, 
where the longstanding convention in counterfactual histories is to take entities to remain constant in the in the thought experiment while surrounding sur the, the surrounding circumstances change, the situation here seems to be reversed. The initial thought experiment, or to, in to initiate the thought experiment, you ask that we imagine the Jamaican planter making decisions in a North American context, nothing out of the ordinary there. But in the long temporal arc covered by this paper, it begins to feel that the genocide of Jamaican slavery goes from being the work of Jamaican planters to that of the formerly enslaved and their descendants. From a situation in which, quote, the demographic strategy of the Jamaican slaveholder was one of clear choice, end of quote, to one in which, as you quote Dan Stone, the characteristics of traumatic memory cannot be suppressed at will. There seems to be more than simply memory implied in the phrase traumatic memory. In quoting Prime Minister Holness, Holness is the use of violence has followed us from slavery, or in saying that the island has never fully recovered during the second half of its history from the violence of its first half. Here I would note that in Holocaust studies, a core issue has been what Pierre Vidal Naquette calls the transformation of memory into history, the threat that the memories of the Holocaust that the memories of the Holocaust that have sustained Jewish Jewish identity will disappear as the survivors of the genocide die, that what was initially transmitted as the horror of genocide will be passed on as the normalizing knowledge of the horror. Your paper ends on a note that suggests the opposite to be the case case in post-genocide Jamaica the transformation of the island's violent slave history into memory, into Jamaican cultural identity. If the analogy between slavery and genocide is more secure in the wake of your argument, which I think it is, shouldn't we be inclined to see greater similarities between the post-genocidal experiences of Black Jamaicans and diasporic Jews? Or if I may be so frank, would we ever speak of the traumatic memory of the Holocaust in this way? Thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen. So maybe we can uh, let Orlando answer. And then if we have time, maybe for one question to satisfy the audience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen, and me for those very, very stimulating and uh, insightful comments. Um, yeah, I thought there are two um, basic um, issues. That there are many issues in the end that to do with the nature of the counterfactual and so on. Um, uh, but um, I want to just look at um, the question of um, protracted protracted um, genocide, which I'm suggesting distinguishes Jamaican from the concentrated um, genocide of um, um, the Jewish people. And um, the second question, which I kind of Decided to leave out in the end, in the end um, um, since it can so easily lead to misunderstanding. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, that, that, that's okay. This is the paper I sent, and um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's uh, and um, it relates to a lot of issues which um, I have um, with um, contemporary thinkers, especially in America, less so in the Caribbean. But um, so I lead two lives, and I um, uh, so. Um, they, you know, I'm open to suggestion and I was looking forward very much to what um, uh, uh, people have to say about um, protracted genocide, that um, is it possible to go on over a period of 183 years? Um, and um, I, um, Lemkin, in fact, suggests that, that, um, that it indeed, and I, I took some... Um, uh, uh, comfort from that fact that, uh, and um, there are many people who, people other, other than the Black Americans who can um, claim that, certainly um, North American Indian ethnocide is seen as a protracted one, and if we accept the Pope's identification of ethnocide with genocide, um, that of the North American Indians, is 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 a protracted one even longer than that of um black americans and there there are other peoples who have um similarly um suffered but it's something i'm open to i mean should we confine um 
uh, you know, um, uh, Card sort of talks about the body counts um, as, as, as being something which you should be careful not to um, get too obsessive. One could talk about the time count mm -hmm. as something which we should uh, perhaps not get too um, concerned. But it's a legitimate question. Um, for me, I, I'd say one, one of the important things is that there, there's no interlude. There's no period in which um, it had stopped and started again. It was a relentless, um, uh, continuous process, um, beginning with a much smaller population. And then the, 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 the interesting thing was, by the way, that the, the population grew but it grew entirely from imported arms. Um, so they were importing so many and killing so many that they, they, those who were left over were enough to grow the population, um, but nothing as much as the um, as that of um, the, the the Americans. I um I also made the important point, which I didn't have the time to get into in the paper, that um, in justifying the use of um, um, America. Um, uh, as as a construction of that, um, the 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 issue of intent is important. In that, um, could they have done otherwise? And um, because in a way, Engelman and others are suggesting, in fact, that it, that it was the choice they had to make. I mean, you know, the the the, the environment, the diseases, the tropical diseases, and so on. The, the, theme, the African lactation practices and so on made it um, impossible for them, which um, I, I found uh, unpersuasive. But more importantly, a point which I left out is the fact that they made such enormous riches that they could easily afford to import more of the food that they did to feed the slaves. They saw the, the codfish from Canada, the salt pork from America. They were importing the stuff. The recent economic um, history indicates that the average white Jamaican was 36 times wealthier than the average North American white person. So I mean, they could still remain very, very rich. And by the way, much of the wealth of Britain, which you know, from the work of Eric Williams generated a good part of their British capitalism, capitalist growth, came from Jamaica. They were fabulously rich. So it would be just a scrap, a small percentage of the enormous profits that they are making that they could use to import just a little more codfish and mm -hmm. salted pork and wheat. So we were talking about starvation. I mean, you know, people were just dropping dead of starvation. That's how hungry they were. <laughs> Um, and I document this at great length in the sociology of slavery. And they saw it. As for the kids, they just, um, you know, and did not want them. And the children lived absolutely miserable lives and uh, most died, uh, again, of malnutrition and the diseases that um, were very well done. So, and this was a continuous process. It, there was no letting up. It just continued right through for the 183 years. And so it was uh, in spite of all the revolts. So I, I, I feel justified in saying that this, this meets the definition of protracted genocide. But I'd love to get um, more um, um, responses to this um, to come up with a more nuanced sort of um, view of this, so whether the concept makes sense at all, whether, as I said, the body, like the body counts, it's important, the time counts, that, you know, maybe no more than five years or 10 years or something like that. I don't find that plausible, but um, now your other point is more serious, is equally serious now. I, when a people have suffered oppression for many years, decades, centuries. Uh, two kinds of victimization, two kinds of um, uh, damage, and the very word damage in itself, sort of um, contestable and controversial, take place. There is the, um, a, there are the external, um, powers of um, oppression, external weapons of oppression and its consequences. And as we all know, this is what is racism and um, the impoverishment, this sort of 
spattered after hundreds of years. Black Americans end up slavery with zero wealth and so on and so forth, which have consequences. And by the way, there's now a very interesting literature emerging finally on the legacies of slavery, which is trying to quantify, trying to con quantify um, the, um, uh, the, the, the consequences of slavery in a very interesting way. Now, <laughs> they're gonna come back <laughs> they come back for you <laughs> yeah sorry um uh i got that habit from sea lodge <laughs> my point i thought was, um the um there's also something else that goes on with oppression and that's immiseration the effects of oppression on the oppressed that is what Elkins dared to touch on and got himself in serious trouble, um, uh, the, relegated to the dustbin of history, as I say. Um, there was a time when a few sociologists and historians did go there, including Du Bois, let me say. Um, but there are others like Abram Cardiner and um, who um, did. Um, look at that. What are the effects? Starting about 19, and you could read any number of works. I mean, all the black sociologists, early back, so right down to um, Kenneth to Clark, who, as you know, was this social psychologist who made a social science argument for um, Brown versus Board of Education uh, with his doll studies showing the effects of oppression on little black kids and why they choose white dolls instead of black dolls. That was part of that tradition of looking at what the consequences of immiseration were. Starting about 1970 or, uh, yeah, 70 or so, that became a huge no-no. They're all tied up with Moynihan and blaming the victim and a major study which came out at this time by Ryan on blaming the victim and um, the culture of poverty and all the rest of it. And that all added up to one of the central prohibitions in social science and certainly in my discipline. And increasingly in history because the historians also began to toe the line you have nothing to say on the effects of oppression on the oppressed. That's a no-no in scholarship. That's an absolute no-no. And, uh, and there are a set of swear words and uh, terms of abuse <laughs> for anyone who dares to go there. Now, that's America. I don't dare to go there and I've given up, I, I've given up. I, because I also, I'm very active in Jamaican intellectual life. I, I've been for a long time. I was part of attempting to start a socialist revolution in Jamaica, a special advisor to Michael Manley. Uh, we failed, but you know, it was a great experience. I've done that, I'm very much involved and we have a rich intellectual tradition. Now, because Jamaica is a black society, I can go there. And indeed I have on one of my slides, just a newspaper, article just a few weeks ago talking about the legacy of slavery and that's where they're going and and the talk and the violence uh, during the prime minister talk about i mean i was quoting him yeah. um the legacy of violence going back to slavery what he's talking about is the effects of oppression on the oppressed now here's one of the big differences between america and um, the caribbean but especially jamaica you can't go there in America. None of you dare go there, uh, you know. Um, and um, I think that's sad, but uh, it's one, part of the reason is, is it the white gaze or the black bourgeois gaze? I don't know. Um, the, the need to, uh, one, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna get sort of um, a little sort of controversial here. There's the need and about the time, you know, I published the article you mentioned. I also published another article on rethinking black history in which 
the, the bourgeois voice became important. And what is important in that voice? And there's some aspects of that in Jewish history is a usable past. How do you create a usable past? And um, uh, bourgeois historians insisting then in a reinterpretation of the past, which satisfies the need of bourgeois historians, but which does not um, do justice to the facts. And um, so I can go on much more on this, except to say that I can say this, I rarely say this here. I can say this easily in Jamaica because, you know, I mean, this is the prime, it's not just the prime minister, everyone sort of sees um, the, the consequences of oppression, the immiseration, what it does, what it does, the violence of the slaveholder class against slave women. Sadly, sadly, got replicated in a chain of oppression in which anyone who has any command over anyone else abused. And it is replicated in the abuse of men over women or of, of, of adults over children. So we still beat children um, in Jamaica to a degree which is sort of, you know, I mean, outrageous. Um, the use of the cat nine did not stop with slavery. The, 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 as late as 2000, a Jamaican judge was sentencing people to 30 lashes of the cat nine. And the people finally woke up and said, oh my God, what are we doing? And it finally um, um, was um, uh, abolished. It's still on the books. They're just not doing. So what I'm saying is, um, it's perhaps not possible in this North American US climate of all the gazes History and sociology <laughs> subject to gazes and um, the white gaze, the black bourgeois gaze, uh, the black bourgeoisie who want to have a history which they can be proud of and uh, or the sensitivity about um, the past uh, makes certain things unsayable. And I, when I open my big mouth and say it, I get sort of confused <laughs> and I call it, I call a conservative here. I go to Jamaica and people are still mad with me for sort of messing up the economy in the 1970s with a damn socialist, <laughs> social support of Manly and Castro and so on. You know, I mean, it's only at my older age that people are beginning to be less abusive of a <laughs> communist sort of wrecker of the economy of the 70s. So it's a funny kind of schizophrenic life I have, you know, I mean, but you know, I've gotten used to it. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Thank you so much. No, and I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we we don't have time for for a question. When we, well, uh, I don't. We're supposed to be at the restaurant at six fifteen, um, but. Uh, if you if you answer in one minute, yeah, Orlando. Will, okay, right, right. so we have a question. Right. One question here. Thank you for coming, Professor. My name is Paul Lee. I'm a visiting scholar in the Department of African American Studies. I'd like to ask you about two gentlemen that you have an acquaintance with, but I've never seen you write about. The first one was a young constable in Kingston, Jamaica, when in November 1927, Marcus Garvey was deported from the United States. There, this young constable had a gift for. Um, Short stenography. Short I'd like you to tell us who this was and give us an assessment of his work. The second gentleman I'd like to ask you about was an African-American leader who spoke at the London School of Economics on February 11, 1965. Among the young Caribbeans there were two young men from Trinidad, Tony Martin, who later became the premier uh, Garvey scholar, and a young hustler named Michael De Freitas, who was in the process of recreating himself as a black power American. leader known as Michael Abdomalik and Michael X. And there was also a young lecturer there, you. Can you tell us who this visiting Afri African-American leader was and tell us what his effect was on their students? Thank you. <laughs> well, the first person I referred to was my father. Uh, who, when Marcus Garvey was deported by the FBI, 
I think, tried to start the first monster revolu revolution um, to Jamaica. The balloon aristocrats went berserk. Because here's this bad man, a sort of maniac. It's going to come to a quiet little island. So they decided that the way to get him is on some form of treason and, um, and to, that they would certainly get it from his speeches. So they asked a young detective uh, who turned out to be the best shorthand person because there are no tape recorders at the time to tail him and um, write down all his speeches and eventually they'll certainly be able to get him on subversion, like treason and so on. My father did that and um, yes, his shot and was perfect. And so the best records of Garvey's speeches in the world is my, are my father's account of these speeches. Well, that's not the end of the story. In the course of doing that, he became converted to Garvey. <laughs> <laughs> and the authorities never forgave him. They never promoted him. Um, Eventually, he was quite radicalized and he started the Police Federation Union, which alienated him even more and they kicked him out of the force. So that is uh, the story of my dad. And I grew up with the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. So, so there's far more of this on, in the book, um, Paradox, Freedom. Um, so what happened during my... Again, my um, you, you fast forward to my new left days in uh, at the lecture in the London School of Economics. This, there was uh, Malcolm X, and um, yes, we were very very moved by Malcolm X, and um, we all. Um, um, I was then on the editorial board of New Left Review, and I remember the entire New Left Review, Terry Anderson. Uh, and, um, um, were there. Um, and um, what effects? Oh, he had a very powerful effect on, 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 on all of us. And um, I, um, I was, you know, then correcting the, the manuscript of the, um, my thesis for the first book, The Sociology of Slavery. And um, I, I'd say he had a very radicalizing effect. He's a very, you know, just such a charismatic person. And um, uh, I um, I used to say the effect was just extremely galvanizing, and um, and it led me to make an important decision, which is to give up my position at the London School of Economics and return home, which I did a year later. <laughs> uh, and you know, I've been. Um, Radical ever since, except uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Those are the perfect, famous last words. And uh, I wish we could continue this, uh, you know, another Thanks two hours. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Orlando and Stephen, for this fabulous exchange. And, thank you, Marianne. Thank you. 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 Ah.